All right. Well, good afternoon, and thank you all so much for coming today to, to, um, to the Diverse Brain Seminar. My name is Denise Kai, and I'm on the Committee for Diverse Brain. The goal of Diverse Brain Series is to ensure that everyone who comes to Mount Sinai and the Freeman Brain Institute feels welcome and truly able to bring their full selves to work. A critical part of building that environment is to learn from each other and from experts around the country. This is the eighth year of the series, and I learn something different at every single talk. Diverse Diverse brain seminars don't attempt to answer all questions that you might have about identities and life experiences that make us who we are, but instead provide opportunities for discussion and shared understanding. It gives me great pleasure to have Dr. Ann Foster Sterling here to Sinai uh, to talk about gender identity today. I'll pass it off to Dr. Giovanna Khalid to give a formal introduction. Thank you all for being here. Hi. <clears throat> Uh, I'm honored to introduce Dr. Anne Fastow Sterling today. She is the Brown University Professor Emerita and Fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Dr. Fastow Sterling's expertise spans many disciplines, ranging from the di developmental biology of the fruit fly, its reproductive system, uh, through to gender studies, and even the study of science and technology disciplines themselves. Over 20 years ago, she authored the acclaimed book, Sexing the Body, examining the nature versus nurture debates over sex, gender, identity formation. And more recently, she's turned to dynamic systems theory to try to understand how infants first acquire their understanding of their own gender identity. I don't want to take up too much of her time, so I'll stop there. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Fausto Sterling for this virtual seminar. Thank you. Um, I guess, Ken, uh, am I ready to share the screen? I think so. There we go. Come on. There we go. Oh, not right. So um, thank you very much. Uh, I, it's just a pleasure to be here. And I'm particularly grateful to uh, Giovanna Kahlo for doing a lot of back and forth before we finally arrived on the format and the date um, and other details. Also want to thank Denise, Tom, Veronica, and Aster for their help in the technological and other organizational aspects of this, of this talk. Um, the title of my talk is, is Gender Identity, It's Biological, Right? And the subtitle is Rooting Out Categories and Adopting a Unitary Framework for Gender Identity. Now, in order to do this, I, I want to start with going through what some of the categories are, because there's a, a lot of vocabulary that we've used over the years, um, and people mix them up and are confused because new words keep coming into existence and old words keep going out of fashion. So I wanna give a very quick timeline um, of, of how this, of what some of the words are and when they were relevant. Uh, in the, from the 1900s to the 1940s, primarily sexologists and psychologists used a variety of words to describe um, people who today we, would, we might call non-binary or sex diverse, um, they use words like invert to describe um, uh, homosexuals. They also use the word homosexual. Uh, and they con confused and often overlap the idea of invert with someone who was a cross-dresser or a transvestite um, or, uh, or someone who was transsexual, who they also refer to as an eonist. This is a very now archaic word. Um, and they pretty much all figured that this that these differences were some aspect of what we would today call sex, some some aspect of bodily difference. This changed very dramatically in the period from the 1950s to the 1970s, when, um, as I am using the work of a number of others, say gender itself was invented. Until that time, sex was really the only category that um, that. Uh, psychologists and sexologists and physicians had to work with, and it was John Money um, and um, and Robert Stoller, who I'll, I'll get into in a minute, 
who coined the idea of gender in order to solve a problem that had come into being with the concept of sex. But with the invention of gender, the, the idea of gender identity and gender versus sex came into being, came, became not only common parlance, but came to dominate how we think about things. Uh, from the 1980s to about 2010, some other new ideas came in that were primarily came in through a medical a, um, avenue from the uh, uh, DSM-3, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental uh, Disorders. That, and these ideas were the idea of gender identity disorder, um, which was used instead of the idea of transsexuality. Um, and for the first time, introducing children into the discussion, into the formal discussion, um, gender identity disorder of childhood. Uh, DSM kept changing its mind about what it wanted to call people. And so from 2000, 2011 to the present, um, they introduced the idea of gender dysphoria, but also um, scholars in, in, um, uh, in gender studies and biology began to um, re-emphasize the interrelationship between gender and sex and introduce the term gender sex, which I now use pretty exclusively. I'll explain it in the talk. Um, and through the activism uh, of uh, trans, um, trans affirmative groups, trans activists of various sorts, the notion of gender affirming care replaced the older ideas of, um, of sex change surgery. Uh, and of course, gender affirming care involves a number of things, not just surgery. Future trends, I think, um, will, will we see, uh, we will, we, will we see, I'm going to argue that we ought to see the, um, the binary of gender versus sex disappear and the notion of normal variation and the end of binary gender identity. Uh, will will come will come to be the predominant point of view, and a new term which um, which I first learned from my colleague uh, Sari van Anders um, would be not only gender sex but gender sexuality because in fact um, pretty much every discussion of sexuality and sexual orientation also has a gender component to it. So instead of sort of just not looking at that incorporated into the discussion and how we think about it. So John Money. Um, John Money uh, dealt with the fact that he was he was working with um, with children who we would today refer to as intersex or having um, uh, differences of sexual development. Uh, but the medical world had gotten far enough along in its understanding of sex, that is the body, to realize that it was way more complicated. It wasn't a, a unitary thing, but you could have um, sex chromosomes of one sort, but hormones of another sort. Um, you could have external genitalia that made you, um, that were, uh, were for all intents and purposes, male genitalia, but chromosomes that were female, um, female chromosomes. Um, and all in all, sex, which had been the thing that doctors had looked to as the true way of identifying what category a person belonged to, turned out not to be working very well. So, um, so Money coined the, idea, coined the idea of gender, he didn't coin the word, but he applied it to identity for the first, um, for the first time. And one of the scholars who's written about his work wrote that intersex children did not only need one clear gender of, re of rearing, but also an unnamed uh, unambiguous genital morphology, as as Money thought, um, and thus, and that point of view kept the body and psyche link. That is, uh, Money recommended not only that <clears throat> children be reared in a particular with a particular specific sex of rearing, but that their body should be adjusted through early surgery to match that um, that sex of rearing. And we can go back to that later if if you want. But the other aspect of Money's work is that um, is that he believed he found social identity um, and I'm wondering if I can get rid of that. No. Uh, so can I move it? No. Oh, I can move it. Yeah. OK. Um, sub subjective identity um, and uh, and the public role and expression of identity he believed to be inseparable 
So they were constantly still working together. And he really did operate with the view of a gender sex identity. So you had one side of the coin was a private experience of gender role, and the other side of the coin was the public expression of gender identity. Now, Stoller um, kind of doubled down on this, uh, but also really moved things around. He introduced the notion of core gender identity, um, and this is actually the concept on which affirmative care is based today. He introduced this idea in 1964, and with it, he also introduced a strict sex gender distinction in which psychology need not conform to biology. And psychology was the location of the true gendered self is so fixed that the only recourse, um, even in adults, uh, for people whose bodies do not match their psyche um, is, is, um, is to change the body to match the psyche. That is, he viewed the psyche um, as being um, far less flexible than the body itself. Um, and if one needed a congruence between body and psyche um, in order to um, exist comfortably in the world, then what had to change was the body. Um, and so this really was the basis. And he worked, by the way, he was one of the, found the founder of the first West Coast clinic for adult transsexuals. And um, he worked primarily with a, a with a um, transsexual clientele. And so his idea really, his ideas really helped form the basis of, um, of the justification, if you will, for transsexual surgery, which had begun prior to him, but which developed this theoretical underpinning with his work. So in order to see, just visualize how some of these words have changed and used, I did uh, I, I made some Google engrams. For those of you who don't know what those are, Google has a huge database of books, and you can um, and and you can get them to search words when words first appeared in books in a in a in their database from 1800 to 2019, um, and you can do it for shorter or longer periods of time. So I started seeing visually when some of these words became active. And what you can see is that the notion of transsexual, the blue line, and transvestite, the gray line, kind of were active, actually were, were visible in, in books, um, actually much before 1955, but they travel along together pretty much. That is, a, and a lot of time and paperwork and effort was made on the part of, of scholars trying to tell, figure out what it was that distinguished a transsexual from a transvestite. Um, and with, um, with the uh, trans rights movements, uh, these words, and, and I think greater understanding or a greater cat development of strict categories for these words, they separated out a little bit. Um, but, with it, but it really is with the development of the concept of gender, which starts in about here, that the term transsexual, which suggests that it's about sex and not gender, goes into comes enters into disuse, and the term transgender, which says it's the psyche, not the body, um, takes off. And you can see how now transgender is the most commonly used term and the pref pref preferred use. So. But not only transgender, we have what I'm calling proliferating gender identities. And I'm sure everybody in the audience is aware of this and um, more or less com comfortable with it. Um, but uh, I just did some engrams for a few of these words. Some of them are so new that you really don't have much data yet because obviously they move, these word, word uses move, there's a time lag between their use in the street and on the internet and, into, and when they get into books. But again, if you look at, um, at cisgender, non-binary, gender queer, um, and gender diverse doesn't begin to take off until about here, post 2016, you see that these words, um, that these words are kind of moving along very slowly. And after 2009, they become very active in books. And the cisgender is particularly interesting because basically it was invented as a term um, in this period to balance out the idea of transgender. It was invented as a way to mark the unmarked 
um, supposedly normal, which is how it was how it was thought of, um, or how some people thought of it. And I'll get back to that marking the um, unmarked uh, in later on in the talk for for at least at least briefly. So you see that some of the words that we're using now are very recent in um, in our vocabulary and in our usage. Um, so I had some summertime conversations here. There, get that out of here for a minute. Summertime conversations with some children who were visiting various ones. Um, and these kids are all live in the US. They live in different but very progressive communities. And I just wanna share a, what a few of them said because the children are, are, are at the forefront of new words and new vocabularies in this area. So, come on. Sorry. Here we go. So one 12 year old said, the kids are all like pansexual or asexual or whatever. This is how 12 year olds talk about it to each other. Um, and they were willing to share with this adult. Um, and a 16 year old, uh, uh, the older sister of one of these children said, in her class, they talked about it differently. This is a four year age difference, mind you. Everybody wants to be gay, but I think a lot of kids don't take it seriously enough. Um, and one other 12 year old said, it seems like no one is gay anymore. Everyone is non-binary and aromantic or asexual. I think that's too bad. And this, this 12 year old has two lesbian mothers and I think feels kind of defensive of them. Um, but the point is that the, that these wor these new words are coming fast and furiously, and it's out of the mouths of 12 year olds who we should be listening to more. And then there's one other source of words uh, that I'm calling strictly medical. And these came from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manuals for Mental Disorders in 1980, DSM-3, under the heading psychosexual disorders, entered the terms transsexualism, gender identity disorder of children and homosexuality. And as many of you may know, especially the homosexuality raised a storm with the gay rights movement and, and it had disappeared by DSM-4 in 1994, um, which had now a new set of categories, sexual and gender identity disorders. Um, and it still had the gender identity disorder of children, um, but also added in gender identity disorder in adolescents or adults. And then DSM-5 from 2013, um, and there's a revision 2022 that doesn't change things too much. Um, entered in uh, yet a new set of categories, gender dysphoria, and, and it had gender dysphoria in adolescents or adults and gender dysphoria in children. And we'll see also that here too, the DSM tremendously influenced the vocabulary um, that got used uh, in, in um, books and also on the internet where you see, um, you see gender, dys, um, uh, gender dysphoria taking off here you have um, gender identity disorder of children just coming up a little bit and disappearing again. And then um, gender identity disorder just in this period from DSM-4 uh, DSM and, and it dies back out again at DSM-5. So lots of things influencing these vocabularies. Um, and, uh, and they're changing quickly. So there's a parallel road, uh, road though, of, which is the study of what I will call, and I'm putting in, in um, scare quotes, normal infancy, um, and the beginnings of the field of gender of developmental psychology in the 1930s. And this, um, this, this began. Uh, this really is where the study of gender development in um, in children really has taken place in a non-medical form. So, and it began with a, um, 
with the Laura Spellman Rockefeller Memorial Fund, which funded five centers of excellence to study um, development and uh, uh, development in infants. And these were at the in the 1930s. This was the University of Iowa, Columbia, University of Chicago, Berkeley, and Yale. And I want to talk particularly about the work of Arnold Gazelle at Yale. Each of these places had different, historically different kind of modes of thought influencing them, but Gazelle was particularly influenced by Darwin and naturalism, a little bit by system theory uh, um, uh, and von Bertalanffy, um, and also the, uh, the psychologists and some of the, and some of the um, eugenicists, Hall, Galton, Binet, and Terman. Um, and he, in turn, formed the basis on which the famous Dr. Spock wrote his book on normal development, the current things that you see in, in pediatrician's office, the Brazelton uh, de developmental norms, and things like Bailey scales uh, came, came out of. So Gazelle really, really went at it. He really, um, he really wanted to do a natural history of influence uh, of infancy, and he published uh, this Atlas of Infant Behavior in two volumes. I, I got it out of the Brown Library. It's quite a remarkable set of books, and um, he sees it as a systematic, a systematic delineation of um, uh, 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 oops. Here we go, systematic delineation of the forms and early growth of human behavior patterns. And here, this is all, these are all photographs he took. He had this big sort of photographic theater where he filmed and took stills of, and of this child at uh, every, two, every two weeks, you can see four weeks, et cetera, and going on. And, um, and another interesting thing is that they, they weren't particularly interested in gender, they took uh, although they, the babies were naked, so they knew what sex they were. Um, and only when you get up to about 52 weeks do you see an indication of gender at all with the little bow in the hair um, and then the hair length later on. But Gazelle wanted, um, wanted to, uh, to observe everything. So and he charted everything. So he said, we've attempted to chart in a systematic manner major areas of the infant's behavior world. They looked at postures, supine, prone, ultimately upright, space-defying projections of posture, rolling, pivoting, squatting, crawling, creeping, cruising, kept records of all of this. Um, his awareness of persons, smiling, laughing, crying, responsiveness to gesture, all of these things. He wanted to completely map infant behavior. Of, and he and he didn't give one behavior priority over another. He just went for everything. It was a it was a natural history, and he had his reasons. Um, the one of the main things about the Laura Spellman Rockefeller Foundation is that it was interested in child welfare, and um, and Gazelle himself wanted to develop what he called a theory of scientific adoption. Um, so he wanted to be able to test an infant that needed adoption and match it to, um, to parents who were well suited. So he thought that he could scientifically um, govern adoption. And, uh, and in general, this line of work on infant development in the 1930s involved rationalizing child welfare. Um, and I have to say that child welfare has morphed now into a, a monster, as shown in the works of recent books by Dorothy Roberts and Laura Briggs, regulating race and gender normative state policies. And I'll, I'll mention this again shortly. So where is this line of research today? Um, it's primarily found in its descendants, intellectual descendants, primarily in the International Conference, Conference Congress of Infant Studies, um, or ICUS, as they um, pronounce their acronym. This summer, I went to an ICUS meeting um, that in Ottawa, and because I wanted to learn more about what the contemporary work does, and because I was puzzled by something I'll mention in a second. Um, at this meeting, there were 700 participants and hundreds of presentations and posters. And the two points I want to make here are that these folks don't study gender at all. 
Um, and and when I would point that out to them, they just they were like, oh yeah, right. We don't seem to study gender. What, what, I wonder why. Um, they occasionally study sex. That is, they may look at physical development. Um, but uh, the other thing, and the other reason I went is they use the research approaches that I find extraordinarily attractive. And it's more in this natural history um, mode, um, but I'm gonna circle back to these later. Um, but they, um, they actually study what the infants do. They do longitudinal studies, they, have, uh, they use dynamic systems. Um, it's just, and they apply them to all sorts of things that infants do, just not gender. Um, and uh, so uh, I'll, in a minute, I'll address why. Um, so, but I need to add in one other person, which is Lawrence Kohlberg, um, who in 1966 developed, published a critical paper in which, um, in which he developed cognitive approaches to the study of gender identity. And it's Kohlberg and his followers um, who, uh, who really have done all of the normative work on gender and development. Uh, Kohlberg broke with Gazelle's view that young children's attitudes result from physiological maturation. Um, instead, he said sex role concepts and attitudes change, change with age because of universal age changes in cognitive development. Um, and a child's sex role uh, concept is the result of active structuring of experience, not the process passive products of social training. So the attractive part of Kohlberg's uh, point of one attractive part was that um, was that he brought the child's active participation into it. He, um, he clearly rejected Freudian views of gender development and he connected his point of view, he linked his work to the clinical work of Money and Stoller. And thus resulted, um, an enormous body of work on normative gender and development, much of it very, uh, very much in use today and very uh, foundational. We have, and it's some of it summarized in this book, Gender and Development by Blakemore, um, Berenbanen and Libin, um, or in this enormous review by Rubel, Martin and Berenbaum, in which they study, um, they study uh, or review all of this work on gender-related constructs and content, theoretical analysis of gender development, conclusions of future, future developments. The only thing that's missing from this huge chapter is there's nothing about non-binary development. So the word transsexual or transgender or homosexual um, is essentially not mentioned or discussed in this review. So this is, this is, um, this is one kind of development without the other. And uh, so now let's look for a second at what's going on here. We have, we've, I've, I've covered, over, I've covered this sexology and psychiatry of sexual development um, with uh, with Ellis um, Benjamin uh, Hirschberg, Hirsch, who worked with sex, followed by Money and Stoller, who tried to fix sex by adding in gender, the input from the DSM, input from Queer theory, and this, this work was very much in conversation with queer theory, trans theory, and feminist theory. And on the other side, we have infant development, developmental psychology, Gazelle, and his ideas of maturational stages, which were important for emotional development, physical development, and cognitive development. Um, and then Kohlberg, who added to cognitive development, or took as cognitive development a subset of developmental events that involve gender, but also from cognitive development, we had people study perception, memory, and language. And what you see is that gender ends up being swept in in this circle to the medical and feminist theory aspect of development, but it's left out of all of the rest of developmental psychology, which instead does use cognitive development, but uses also studies also physical development and emotional development. If you think about it, it's pretty strange. You you wouldn't you you it's hard really to think about gender development as being without emotional an emotional component of it. But at any rate, gender becomes 
separated out from the mainstream of developmental psychology in this period, and really in the starting with Kohlberg in the 60s, and hooked in to the more medical studies, but then also the humanist and theoretical studies and activist studies that come from feminism, queer theory, gay rights, trans rights, et cetera. So that's where we are today. So what is my project? Um, I have, I'm working on this and I'm not there yet, I should say, uh, in case you think I'm gonna have an answer, I don't. Um, but uh, I'm working, I'm trying to develop a theoretical approach, first of all, that can encompass the full gamut of children and their senses of self, their identities, as they emerge during infancy and toddlerhood. And I have certain criteria for this theory or for this project. Um, the theory um, must, uh, the construct that I, that I come up with must be non-binary and body-based, that is materialist, but not essentialist. And I'll get back to that in a minute too. Um, it must involve, be epistemically just, that is it al and allows variability to exist. Um, the, the, um, and I'll discuss what I mean by epistemic justice in a second. And I want it to open new avenues for empirical study, which I think it will. So the old way of looking at things involves certain common underlying assumptions. Uh, one is that binary gender identity is normative, that identity is static and unsituated, that is, that is uh, money and those thereafter who uh, the Kohlberg's followers look at identity as something that comes into being at a certain time and then it's there, you have it, it's unchangeable and it doesn't seem to have a context. Um, and gender identity is determined either primarily by sex in the point of view of some people and a little bit by gender or from the point of view of other people, a little bit by sex and a lot by gender. The thing about binary gender being normative it is, the, is that it's only the non-binary that requires explanation. And um, I'm going to come back to that in a second. Um, my underlying assumptions are that, that there is a gender sex identity is itself non-binary, that it's a continuum. Um, and that means that variability within a single process is what we need to understand, to understand um, the development of, of different people on different components of the continuum. Um, that cultural, it, that the categories that we use, as I think I demonstrated really in the first part of the talk, it's are imposed uh, as part of our cultural practice on this existing continuum. And so we have categories that we've that we've sort of um, tried to use to try to sort out or carve up the continuum so that we can look at it. And that identity itself is not fixed or static, but that it is a dynamic process. Um, so if I go back, does that gonna go back? No, back this way. There we go. So I just want to show you one thing here, which is um, if you look at, again, this heterosexuality on this curve, on this engram, which like, um, like the cisgender, heterosexuality doesn't appear in books as an object of study because it is the unmarked category, the norm that doesn't require explanation until this period here, the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, when suddenly not suddenly, but where there is an explosion of activist movements, uh, feminism, gay rights, trans rights, um, that begins to say, uh, we're not abnormal, we belong in the center of study. Um, and, uh, and anyway, why, don't, why isn't heterosexual, heterosexuality explained as well as homosexuality? So you see that that when you begin to, um, to use a single, <clears throat> a single model explanation rather than um, explaining the norm, only explaining the non-norm, um, that suddenly the unmarked category, in this case of heterosexuality, becomes visible in a way that it, that it wasn't before. So 
Next, what do I mean by just research? Just research, first of all, and perhaps primarily should promote livability. Um, and let's see if I can get rid of this. There we go. Um, and you get out of here too. All right. Um, so first, gender sex research should be situated within the context of lives as they are lived and guided by the question of what maximizes the possibilities for a livable life. What minimizes the possibility of unbearable life or indeed social or literal death? Um, this is a quote from Judith Butler uh, and I think it's still very relevant today. And second, rather than doing away with gender, we need to recognize gender self-determination as one of the critical and crucial practices that makes trans lives li livable in particular. This, um, these quotes come from uh, a really nice piece, recent piece by um, S. Carhu called Gender Skeptic Skepticism, Translivability and Feminist Critique. Um, and I just wanna give you some examples from, from our current world in the United States of unlivable lives. Um, these are headlines that I just took off of newspapers. This is September 9th, 2022. Mom says trans eighth grader was questioned by Texas officials at schools. Uh, or this one, for also about Texas, transgender Texas kids are terrified after governor reports that parents can be investigated for child abuse. Um, and uh, terrified that because they could be, their parents could, they could be taken away from their parents. Or this one, at least seven states proposed anti-trans bills in the first week of 2022. These are all things that make trans lives unlivable. Um, and here's a, here's a map of uh, state laws. Um, the orange is state law, state state laws that ban transgender students from participating in sports consistent with their gender identity. Uh, so we see that, that, um, that when we're making theory, when we're doing research, be it biological or psychological, it cannot be in the absence of knowledge about, uh, about what's happening in the world, which is, which is making people's lives either more livable or less livable. Just research also needs to promote um, something called epistemic justice. And there are two components of epistemic justice I wanna talk about. The first are interpretive frameworks, which I'll get into in the next couple slides. Um, that is, pr uh, but as an example, a framework would be, one framework would be uh, privileging a sex versus gender framework over, for example, a gender sex framework. Um, so, the idea of keeping an open mind that there are different interpretive frameworks that uh, that make a difference on, on what kinds of questions you ask, what kinds of answers you seek. Um, and also including a variety of epistemic agents. The scientists are not the only epistemic agents in just research. The subjects are agents and the institutions. And there, this is beginning to happen. There's a whole lot of research. Um, here are a couple of, a couple of articles uh, I'll just read you the titles because they give they tell you what I want you to know about it. Um, what sexual and gender minority people want researchers to know about sexual orientation and gender identity questions, or this one, perceptions of sex, gender, and puberty uh, suppression, a qualitative analysis of transgender youth. Uh, and, <clears throat> or, or I'll, the last one, there is nothing to do about it non-binary individuals' experience of gender dysphoria. Even infants and children are epistemic agents. Uh, this is a quote from an article um, by uh, Ann Johnson called Understanding Children's Gender Beliefs. Um, and she's writing here that about, about how scientists sometimes lose important knowledge because they're not listening to what the kids are saying. Um, the truth about gender categories, if you come into the, into the research project with this idea, is said to be rooted in natural biological categories. So small children who know little about biology, but a lot about human behavior, are said by scientists to have beliefs about gender that are pre-logical or pre-rational. 
meaning that they do not yet construct their ideas about gender on the so-called true and stable foundation of biological knowledge. An example, a young preschooler might tell you that if a girl puts on boy's clothes, she would be a boy. The child, according to the researchers, mistakenly uses cultural cues like hair length or clothing, clothing to determine gender instead of rooting uh, a, a person's gender classification in biological criteria like gender or chromosomes. But in fact, if you, if you look at how scientists themselves measure gender in little kids, the child is the one who's right here because we use cultural cues to measure gender identity in preverbal children. We, ask, we, we observe what they're wearing, we observe who they play with, um, we observe what kind of toys they use and make conclusions about their gender identity. So the child actually is not mistaken at all, um, but in fact, the gender identity itself is constructed from cultural cues. So if we learned how that, if we did research in which we treated our subjects as epistemic agents, we could probably learn quite a lot and we'd have a very different view about, um, about our topic of research. So reframing future research, a couple of examples. So the, to, to reprise my title, it's biological, right? Well, my answer to that is no, um, but, uh, but rather biology is in there, but it's not the basis on which all else is built. So we, let's start with re asking about reframing the binary. The binary is usually seen as sex or sexuality on the one side and gender on the other. Um, and together they form a binary um, of explanations. But what I'm arguing and many others are is that what we really need to be studying always is gender sexuality. That is the majority of areas where these things overlap. Um, and we need to, so we're go, this is in a way reminiscent of money and a rejection of Stoller. Um, that we need to be looking at gender sexuality as they um, are uh, form interacting into a unitary identity. How do we do that? Um, so non-binary, that's obvious. Okay. Um, let me start here with um, this is a this is <clears throat> this is one idea of um, of experiments that the or the things that feed into the idea of cognitive um, differences in um, spatial abilities, um, and this well, this is from this is from a, a, a group of researchers who who wrote a book on how to think different. I'm sorry, wrote an article on how to think differently or how to take feminist critiques of science into account when designing experiments, and they um, they cordoned off at the bottom here uh, what they would call an essentialist model in gray. You start with chromosomes, or you might start with cells in the brain, or you might start with molecules, and you go straight to an experiment, and you get a snapshot result. Um, and yet, you know, all these other things are happening, which feed in um, to development, uh, gendered activities, gendered uh, model, um, cognitive domains, socialization, and you have all sorts of other things going on. Um, sample selection, sample size, types of hypotheses. So, but the um, the way most experiments are done is you start with the with I'll, I'll just say chromosomes for now. It could be any aspect of biology. Um, you take one time point, you get a cross sectional area. You do an experiment, you get a snapshot. Um, that's not what I want to advocate. What I want to advocate and um, and you have a particular type of hypothesis. Usually, it's are the, it's a hypothesis about difference. Is there a difference between um, between males and females, or male identifying and female identifying? But you're looking for differences. You're not looking for how development happens. You're not looking for similarities. Um, and so this that's the most common way things are done. But what if instead you might still, if you're a biologist, you might still be wondering about how the chromosomes work. But instead of asking that directly and going straight to an experiment, you might say, well, how does chromosome activity change with gendered activities? And how does it change over time? So maybe you're gonna take three or more time points over the life cycle. Um, and then you'll combine those together 
uh, in a, to, to see, to look at change over time and cumulative effects. That's the type of hypothesis. So you may or may not see differences at all times. You may see differences change. You may see no differences. Um, but you're, what you're interested in is how do gendered activities affect, um, affect chromosomal activity. Um, and then what you end up instead with is dynamic change and not a snapshot. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about when I talk about, uh, about changing the mode of experiment from, um, from static to active. So the last thing that I said, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll finish off with this and summarize, uh, and is that identity research should be body-based. Um, that is, it should be materialist, but it should not be essentialist. And I'm gonna give you one example from some studies I've done with, um, with toddlers. Um, and this is Stephen and Susie throw the ball. Now, Stephen learned to throw the ball um, before he could walk. And this is because his mother was very interested in playing ball throwing games with him. So he would sit in a very stable position um, and she would roll it to him and he would throw it back. And then here in this image, he's kneeling stably and he can raise that ball up over his head and throw it forward. Um, and by the time he learns to walk, he's already very good at raising the ball up over his head. So he's adding walking into his repertoire, but he has the, the raising the ball and throwing down pat already. So it's in his nervous system. He's learned it in two steps. Susie, on the other hand, is learning to throw the ball at the same time that she's learning to walk. And this is because, although she had some interest in throwing, throwing the ball earlier and her mother did play occasionally with her, it was not um, a maternal priority nor a strong insistence on Susie's part um, to play with the ball um, well before she could walk, but now she's interested, but she's also learning to walk. So she's both unstable on her pins she can sort of toddle along the way a new walker does. She can hold on to the ball, but she can't manage getting it up over her head. And she can manage to just sort of push it forward a little bit, um, but not that nice over the head throw that the boy has. And you can see where I'm going with this, I imagine, for those of you who know the mythologies of throwing like a girl, um, uh, which is Susie is doing right here. She's throwing like a girl. But I'm arguing that she's throwing like a girl, not because she was born with different shoulder articulations, which is one theory um, some sports biologists have, but that she um, learned to throw at a different point in her life. And she learned to throw while she was also learning to walk, which made it difficult for her to master the, a particular kind of throwing. So this is what I mean by it's in the body, it's material, but it is not essentialist. Okay, let me sum up now. Um, this is back to this, uh, to this idea that, um, that I presented to you before um, in which we have, but here I've added in that the infant developmental psychologists have, um, they, they frame their work in terms of, um, of, terms of embodiment process and that it's developmental and dynamic. They use metaphors for development like ecology, rivers and streams, phenomenology, movement. They, um, they do qualitative work. They use cascades, networks, and webs. So that's all in this part of the, of the study. And then you have the more static part over here that um, comes out of sexology and psychology. And what I want to see happen is that gender gets swept into this active kind of study with, um, with, uh, with uh, longitudinal life cycle studies, embodiment process, um, and any, any or all of these different metaphors to put the research together. So what I'm arguing is um, that gender needs to be pried away from the study of gender needs, um, as particularly in, in children, needs to be pried away from this area and moved into this area of infant developmental psychology. Um, and that we'll see a lot of really interesting things develop as that happens. Um, and that my friends is what I have to tell you. So I thank you all. And I guess I have to stop sharing now, is that right?
Yep, I gotta get this, do this, of course. Uh, let's get rid of this. And did I automatic? I did stop sharing. There you guys all are, right? Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Fausto Sterling. Um, we have a Q&A box if anyone would like to add some questions. Um, I will start off by, uh, one of the questions is, uh, you mentioned experiments. Uh, what kind of experiments uh, do you mean in this kind of research? Is it uh, causal inference on observational data or something else? Um, it's not, to begin with, I think it needs to be in a way kind of gazelle and it needs to be very descriptive. And that's that's what uh, what I'm I'm doing in a very primitive way with the data set that I have. Um, which is to, to say, all right, so there's a known sex difference that everybody talks about in playing in how boys and girls throw balls. What can I find out in the data set I have that, that starts with infants who are three months old and goes until they're 15 months? How many times for each, and they're weekly. So each week I can look at an hour of play between a mother and infant. Um, and see how many times do they touch a ball? Is a ball in the room? How many times does the mother throw the ball? How many times do they initiate the ball? What do they do with it? And I can map that weekly for you know 52 weeks. And I can do that for 15 boys and 15 girls. And I can both in that way, look at individual development um, and just see, well, what is going on with learning to throw a ball? Um, so it's totally descriptive and something may or may not fall out of that, I don't know. Um, but um, so that's one one kind of research. And I'm, I'm not very interested in causation right now. I'm interested in in developmental emergence. Um, so uh, that that comes primarily at first from description, um, more strictly designed um, experiments of the causal type, which are really the primary thing that's done in developmental psychology now. They might come with time, but only after there's some decent hypotheses developed from observing what's going on. Uh, so we have a, another question. Um, so how do you propose that scientists studying sex, dif sex differences frame their studies and language to avoid being deterministic? And as a add-on to that, based on your sample of children, how varied is their background and how applicable is that? Um, Okay, well, let me answer the second part of that first, which is um, this sample I have, it's, a, it's a, as it were, a, a found sample that's not a variable, it's not a varied sample at all. Um, and so it's, it's whatever findings I have are applicable to these kids and their families in the particular, and, and it's an old sample. So it's also particularly, it's historically limited. Um, so to do what I'm doing better, uh, needs a larger sample, a diverse sample, or um, more likely collaborative projects of people doing asking similar questions. There are projects like this, again, coming out of this ICUS group. Um, there's a many babies studies, for example, where people are pooling data um, from different countries around the world and asking similar questions, um, but trying to get much more diverse sampling out of it. So that ab absolutely has to happen. Um, tell me the first part of the question again. Uh, the first part was, um, how do you propose that scientists studying sex differences frame their studies and language to avoid being deterministic? Well, I, I think maybe let's not let the, the first thing to do is, is to stop studying sex differences. That is, that language itself usually ends up being deterministic. Um, and if and rather ask, uh, try to reframe the questions around um, around traits uh, in in terms of uh, there's a lot of this of work which I'm, probably you've had people talk on this already the the work on mosaic brains for example um, but uh, but ask so so reorient what what you want to know for example do, do you want to know if you think all right I want to know about a sex difference because there are more girls than boys studying mathematics um, start with the phenomenon and ask what is it that leads people in a positive way to study math um, 
what is going on? I'd, I'd work back. I mean, my own view is that the reason that, that you'd explain 99% of that difference if you dealt with um, with hostility in the classroom, um, but if, if you um, ameliorated that. But anyway, to go to start constructing um, a diagram like the one I showed you at the very end of all of the different things that lead to the, the phenomenon you're trying to analyze and, and presumably solve um, and study the phenomenon in a much more holistic way rather than going straight to, is there a sex difference? Um, and uh, yes, sex differences could come into it, um, but they aren't also a, a difference seen in an adult is, is a, is a, um, is a one-shot thing. For me, anytime, suppose you say like, oh, well, girls don't throw overhand as well when they're 14. For me, that's a starting point. You, you ask how did, over, because then you need to go back and ask how did overhand development appear? How did it develop? Does it develop the same in boys and girls? You have to go back and get a longitudinal a timeline. So, um, so I think on the whole, you want longitudinal studies. You want to start with the phenomenon, not assume a difference, or uh, and look for cultural explanations as well as biological explanations. Not and so, uh, yeah, you can't have the unitary hypothesis, even though you say, well, if it could be a null hypothesis, and I won't confirm it. You know, but I, I think you, we have to stop doing those kinds of experiments. Um, okay. Uh, as scientists, we often use uh, data to inform our studies. Um, how do you choose which of the uh, phenomena you would like to investigate? For instance, how are there studies that definitively show that uh, girls at 14 can't do overhand throws? How do you decide which uh, you're going to study? Well, I, I think from I think people doing doing studies always have you have various reasons for choosing the question. Um, and so the the so the one thing to do is to examine why you're asking the question. So um, a little bit of self-study as it were, to start with. Why, why is this question interesting to me? It, is it important in the in the world? Um, and I don't mean just can you make up an importance to satisfy the NIH requirement that you that it have a reason have a reason for doing it, but that um, that you you ask why it's why it's a worthwhile question to begin with. What is it that led you to want to ask it? Um, and then what are the various sort of streams of influence that move into that into that area of work? It's a little hard to do it for all things in the abstract, but that that would be, I think the first step is to ask, why is this an important question? Why do I wanna study it? Okay, so I think we've got time for uh, one last question and we haven't really touched on um, neuroimaging. So there's one question about, uh, what do you think of the more recent research on brain structures and gender diverse folks at the USC Neuroimaging Informatics Institute and the International Enigma Project focus on gender identity development and the developing brain. Um, and I, I'm not super familiar with this work. Uh, what I usually think about um, about imaging research on brains is that they're not done on developing brains. That is, uh, to to understand anything, uh, it doesn't do to study the brains of recently deceased transgender people or living transgender people who are 35 years old. Um, what, it, what, um, what one needs to do is to do longitudinal studies and not um, a, 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 where one follows the same individual subject over, over a period of years. So I don't know if these studies, the, these institutes are doing that. I, um, I think that there are, there are some develop, brain development projects that really are doing um, developmental work of the sort, longitudinal studies of this, um, rather than cross-sectional studies of the sort I'm talking about. I don't think cross-sectional studies are very useful, especially in brain development, 
because you don't know what the experiences are that led to the brain structures of a 35 year old. And that's really what you want to know since we know, you know, we know that uh, we know about brain plasticity and we know brains change with experience. That's what, what one wants to understand or what I want to understand at any rate. <laughs> okay. Um, so we've reached four o'clock. Um, I don't want to take up anyone else's uh, time beyond uh, the seminar. I know that Dr. Fausto Sterling is very active on Twitter. If anyone wants to continue the discussion. Um, and can uh, I ask these questions? Can you can you keep a record of them? I'd like to look at them later. Yeah, too. sure. Will do. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, for any of the students or postdocs who registered, uh, we'll be in the Zoom discussion room in a minute. So okay, thank and I'm you all. leaving this one, coming yep. to the next one, right. All right. That's right. Thank you all okay. for attending. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Okay, bye.